So hopefully, um, in this presentation, we can clarify some of the myths um, surrounding circular debt and uh, what is the way forward. Um, so let me see if I can make this how this work. So there's a there's a lot that I like I said you know that's been written on circular debt. Um, often it's painted as a cause of the problem rather than an outcome. And painted it, and a number of issues are conflated when we talk about circular debt. And um, you know, I mean, I've seen articles that paint it as something that has arisen from non-payment um, of bills to to many subsidies uh, to you know sort of uh, demand management, um, distribution losses, and so on and so forth. So you know, you've just tried to clarify that. And what is not sufficiently in public discourse, at least as far as we are concerned is the power policy itself, the privatization process, the structure of the industry and future scenarios. Um, many of you may actually be familiar with these uh, three slides, uh, the next three slides, because so much has been written about it in the media. But in order to make the point that I'm trying to make here, or we are trying to make here, um, if you can just bear with us uh, for five minutes, uh, that would help. Um, it was based the 94 policy, you know, subsequently there was a 2002-2003 policy which we don't see as anything materially different. It was based on a structure that was evolved uh, for TAPCO which was uh, considered to be, you know, a seminal um, uh, path breaking deal. A number of different banks were involved, it was a complex deal, in fact, uh, Euro Money Institute um, Investor Magazine called it Deal of the Year and later called it Deal of the Decade. And um, as a result of this, you know, it served as a template on which 1994 power policy was formed. The policy itself was universally lauded by private uh, financiers around the world. There was unprecedented interest uh, from investors, really generally treated as, uh, you know, uh, the gold standard. In fact, the U.S. Energy Secretary of the time went on record to say it was the best energy policy in the whole world. Yeah. Um, there were justifications that were given at the time, and these were World Bank probably articulated these justifications more clearly than uh, anybody else. They'll say that essentially they suggested by prioritizing this, um, we will be able to deliver better, wider, you know, more reliable service. <coughs> this will improve the government's fiscal position. This was a very important claim that was made, and free up public funds for more important um, causes such as health and education. And thirdly, it was also suggested that the subsidies that were being handed out were not helping the poor anyway because most of them were not connected to the grid. Um, you know, anyway. So they were really going towards helping the rich who didn't need them. What was the deal? It's, it's fairly typical of such deals that generation was uh, separated from transmission and distribution. Private investors were offered a tariff of about 6.5 uh, cents. And uh, investors were to be provided, you know, an internal rate of return of between 15 and 18 percent, 18 percent in the case of Hubco, um, after covering for operational costs. And an allowance was made for 80, 20, 10 equity ratio, which may, meant that if they were to invest 100 rupees, they only had to put up 20 rupees, and 80 would be uh, dead. And what is uh, interesting, of course, is that it was uh, that there were two components do this, one was a capacity payment, the other was an energy payment. The capacity payment was simply, it covered all fixed costs. Any business, and I teach at a business school, um, who's offered a deal like this will take such a deal. Because you're essentially covering all fixed costs plus the debt servicing uh, cost. On top of that, you have guaranteed an equity return of 15 to 18 percent and you will be paid irrespective of whether you produce electricity or not. Uh, and the off-taker is contractually liable for repaying uh, the debt. The energy payment basically covers all variable costs. So if you do produce electricity, all variable costs will be covered. Uh, on that, all payments were to be indexed with uh, the US dollar uh, exchange rate and inflation changes. So if the rupee is devalued by 20%, your payment will go up 
uh, accordingly uh, next year. The policy was also crucially, it was blind to the fuel that was going to be used, uh, as well as to the efficiency of the plant, effectively. So even inefficient single cycle cars came online as a result of this. And pretty much everyone opted for oil or gas-based IPV because it is the easiest to set up. On top of that, exemption was given for common corporate income tax. So I think the only tax that they pay is on dividends. Um, from custom duties, from sales tax, you know, and other surcharges on imported equipment. And permission was also given to issue corporate bonds and shares at discounted prices. Um, trying to go to the next slide here. So obviously, you know, given such a deal, investors rushed in. There was a shortfall that was predicted of about 1500 megawatt and we ended up, uh, I think, contracting close to 4000 uh, megawatt as a result of this deal. Now remember, because of the capacity payment, even if the rest of the 2500 megawatt is not being generated, you still have to pay the people who came, uh, who came and invested. So of course, the fiscal situation, rather than improving, almost immediately starts getting worse. Um, so Vagda, in the end, is stuck with the massive overcapacity for which it's uh, contractually obligated to pay. And soon, you know, when we entered the 2000s, the fallout of the policy was quite apparent. Industry um, has essentially come to, or is coming to a grinding halt. How they are managing is beyond me. Uh, a lot of them have shifted to captive power. Um, process industry is the worst sufferer, perhaps, because uh, process, you know, in the nature of process industry is such that if you stop the machines, you know, right in the middle, and that's something that frequently happens with unannounced uh, load shedding, all the material that is in the pipeline is also wasted with that. And Azam also wrote a paper on more price, uh, the price elasticity of various uh, industries. So the more price, they, price elastic ones obviously suffered uh, even more. Um, informal sector, of course, was also terribly affected. Lots of uh, our critical clusters that exist in the uh, informal sector were terribly affected as a result of that. I think I also took the next figure out of uh, your paper of the 530 uh, percent increase in tariffs. Um, which I think is a very conservative uh, figure. Um, but uh, it, it is also, you know, I mean, there's been at least doubling today. We have further good news that, you know, the tariffs have gone up by another 16% um, uh, today. Um, instead of improving, the government's fiscal situation has become dire. Instead of uh, money freeing up to be invested in health and education, you know, there are similar policies that are coming up areas. Now, having you know, sort of seen all that, is the solution to cut subsidies? Perhaps we need to look you know, sort of slightly uh, more closely into subsidies. Seventy, a big problem of course here is energy mix. That you are producing 70% of your energy based on imported oil. Oil is something you don't produce, you import it. Oil prices have been soaring, which has sent uh, your costs uh, soaring as well. Now, on the one hand, your costs and hence your tariffs have been going up because of the nature of policy that was uh, adopted. On the other hand, you have a political government who finds it difficult to pass on the entire cost to customers. I mean, this is a common problem. In the United Kingdom, for example, we have recently allowed universities to triple their tuition fees overnight. So from 3,000 pounds to 9,000 pounds for home students. Okay. Where does 9,000 pounds uh, come from? It's an arbitrary figure. Uh, the fee, 9,000 pounds, still comes nowhere close to covering the costs of educating the student at a good university. Um, in fact, I can tell you about Cambridge that only 15% of our income comes from students' fees. Uh, so they had 
Obviously, there will be many more increases, but they cannot do it on some uh, at once. So, a similar dynamic is uh, on here. The government, of course, in order to ease this, tries to print more currency, which produces more inflation, which puts more um, pressure on the common person, the poor who are not supposed to be hurt because they were not benefiting from these subsidies anyway. This is just a thought ex uh, experiment, uh, really a simple uh, comparison between what happens if you set up a 100 megawatt thermal plant, you know, say, which costs about 100 uh, million dollars in the public sector versus the private sector, given such a policy. In public sector, you will get uh, debt financing of about 12%. And so over 10 years, let's say equal repayments come to about 45 million. You don't have to pay them equity returns. The Genco's in Vakta are not paying paid equity returns, of course, you know, the IPPs uh, are. In the private sector, you'll have to pay more for the same debt because you're a private entity. Um, so that will come to about 11 million dollars more than what you would have to pay in the public sector. Uh, equity return, let's say, get 15% of approximately 4 million per uh, annum, which will come to about 97 million over the life uh, of the project. So for every 25 million, remember 75-25 debt equity ratio, for every 25 million that you're investing in uh, or inviting in equity, the government will end up paying 83 million dollars uh, extra over the life of the project. So the question of course is who is subsidizing who, I mean the numbers can be slightly different but I don't think they will be dramatically different because you know even if you discount it over USD bill rates and, and so forth, uh, the point still I hope comes across. It appears that the situation is going to get worse. So what we are really suggesting here is that so this is the machine that we have uh, brought in and placed. Circular debt is not a cause, it's an outcome. When you crack the handle of the machine, what comes out is circular debt. So if we don't do something about the machine, circular debt will keep coming out. You have to keep paying it off and it will still happen. Well, what happens if oil prices continue to go up, if we get sanctioned? Critical risk for the uh, worsens, which means the risk premium for international investors keeps going up. Um, in such a situation, what would we rather have? Indigenous, you know, energy security, or keep paying higher and higher premiums and remain hostage to whimsical profit-seeking investors? Nothing wrong with profit-seeking, but you have to uh, understand what the context is here. As far as demand management is concerned, um, Pakistan's energy consumption is one of the lowest in the whole world. Even Mongolia's energy consumption per capita is twice that of Pakistan. Um, is that a huge issue? Um, we don't think so. Um, distribution losses, yes. It is a serious issue depending on, especially depending on where you are. In some cases for Lesco, for example, it will be 20%, 15 to 20%, which is fairly normal. In Karachi, it's higher. If you go to KP or Fata, you know, it's, it's significantly worse. Um, if you privatize distribution, what that often leads to in the world is more unrest, social unrest. Why? So what we see in many different countries right now with private distribution networks is that the non payers are being taken off the grid. So thousands of people in many countries right now are being taken off the grid, which is producing significant human and social costs there, and it's also leading to social conflicts. Tracking on non payers uh, what happens when there's piracy? Uh, perhaps the best solution uh, for solving the menace of piracy um, is to lower costs. Uh, which does not seem to be happening. So perhaps, and again, you know, this is an exploratory analysis. Um, it is time to revisit the private policy, uh, power policy. Um, competition. This is not really a market-based policy either, okay? because there is no competition. Okay? You do not have a merchant market where the most efficient producer is being dispatched by the off-taker. We do not have that situation right now. So 
So efficiency, innovation are not rewarded within this policy. Um, and in that way, it is certainly not pro poor. Um, perhaps the bulk of energy needs to be indigenously produced and controlled. They are relying overwhelmingly on imported fuel and foreign investors probably exposes us to massive risks. I mean, we saw what happened in India with the cyclones destroying a large part of the industry network, let's say in one state in Urissa. AES warned that it was not covered by insurance. They refused to build that and they asked the government to subsidize them or help them in rebuilding that, otherwise they were going to go. Okay. Um, I, I think Ashad will probably say something about our goal and uh, you know, indigenous sources of energy production. Uh, but I just want to highlight that yes, energy mix is probably the biggest problem right now. But so is the, um, the regulatory regime within which we contextualize this particular uh, the production of 